Hello, everybody. Um, well, it's, how many of you know who I am? Okay, that's great. <laughs> that's better than most crowds. Normally, it's like three or four people, but this is better. Uh, so, a little background about myself. Uh, I was born and raised in Oregon, outside of Medford, down, uh, what, just about 17 miles from the California border, in a little town called Rouge. Um, I started beekeeping in 2000, yeah, it's going to be uh, April 26, 2003, so my 15th birthday is coming up here this week, I guess. It's next week. Um, so when I started, I decided that I was going to be treatment free the whole way through, um, and this I have a, I, I try to speak to a lot of people about how to start beekeeping treatment free because I think there's a lot of misnomers and things going around that people don't, I mean when you start something new, by definition you don't really know how to do it until you've done it, right? You can study all you want, you learn from various people and of course you're going to run into differing opinions. Um, so I want to want to help people get started with uh, some 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 frameworks and some mindsets and some tools, so that um, the inevitable things won't give your beekeeping experience or leave you with a bad taste in your mouth in your beekeeping experience. Because the last thing that I want is for people to give up and quit. Um, so just, uh, this is being recorded on the little video camera back there, so um, don't feel like you have to take notes on everything. You can, I'm going to post this on YouTube within the next couple of weeks, so you can go back and see maybe something you've missed, maybe something you thought that I've said that maybe I didn't or did, or you want to refresh yourself. So just try to be present and... Um, Feel free to raise your hand and ask questions. I'll be happy to answer any questions as we're going along. I don't want anybody to be confused about what I'm talking about. So if there's something you don't understand or, or didn't catch or something, just raise your hand and, and ask me and I'll try and, and clarify that for you. Um, oh, also, if you want, grab one of these little cards here. These have all the addresses of things that I do. Um, my website, Facebook group, forum, YouTube page. I made a huge error and forgot to put my podcast address on there. But pretty much anywhere you go in here will have also the address of the podcast. So that's easy to find. And it, it's, an easy, it's an easy address. It's just tfb.podbean.com. So it's, it's really easy. All right, so my first talk today is going to be, is called How to Start Beekeeping Treatment Free. Um, so you probably, if you're here, you probably are at least okay with, with what I'm going to talk about. Uh, don't get too many people who are really against me in these sorts of meetings once they hear what I'm, what I'm here for. Um, I have a whole a whole other talk that is kind of why treatment free and you can find that on my YouTube page it's called the case for doing it the hard way so you can check that out if you'd like um, just to kind of recap that really quick for context sake um, treatment free beekeeping is is based around the the scientific concept of natural selection um, over time, we humans have gotten our hands into nature and selected certain organisms, plants, animals to serve our purposes. And when we breed those and kind of change them to serve our purposes, that's called domestication, right? With bees, it's kind of a different situation because with bees, well, take the example of, uh, say, cows or something. When you decide to become a cattle rancher, you don't, you can't go out into nature and catch some cows and put them in a fence, and then you're now a cow keeper. Um, with bees, they need that ability to survive in nature on their own. And so, when you want to become a beekeeper, you can actually go into nature, capture a swarm, 
put it in a hive and start being a beekeeper. So there's a fundamental difference between being a cow keeper and being a beekeeper. We want the bees to maintain the ability to survive in nature. Uh, we can't protect them. We can't keep them in a fence. We can't keep them in a cage, right? They're supposed to go get honey and bring it back here. We can't corral them and control their lives like we can with cows or pigs or horses or, or whatever animal. Um, and the other the reason why I have this picture up here is because in beekeeping culture today, even though it might not seem like it if you're reading a, um, uh, a beekeeping magazine or most beekeeping websites, the, the governing mindset in the beekeeping world is one of treatment, where uh, beekeepers try to, they try to treat bees like farm animals. And as I mentioned before, it doesn't really work very well. And so we've got this thing in, in modern beekeeping where we have kind of a chemical treadmill is what a lot of us treatment-free beekeepers call it. So what happens is a pest or disease comes onto the scene, which is, which is natural in nature. It happens all the time. Um, different organisms mutate and become virulent when they weren't before. Uh, or in the case of varroa mites, you have a pest or a, a parasite from another species that somehow makes the link leap from that species to a different species. And then the new species has to become acclimated over time to that parasite. And there's this idea that bees can't survive mites. But the thing was, that leap wasn't, at the same time as, as Varroa were introduced to the United States, that leap from the original host to Apis mellifera happened a hundred years ago. And there weren't treatments a hundred years ago. And so the bees at the time had to deal with that problem and adapt. And they did. And that's what people talk about when they talk about Russian bees today. Unfortunately, I think the, the, the Russian bees situation has gotten a lot watered down since they were first introduced to the United States because, again, beekeepers are very loss averse, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, and so they started treating even the Russian bees, which were supposed to be resistant, rather than letting them deal with the problem themselves. A certain number of losses is not only normal every year, it is actually desirable. To continue the processes of natural selection, we need to remove the weak members of the population, the weakest members of the population. If you think about it in the case of um, gazelle and cheetahs, we really need the slowest gazelle to be eaten by the cheetahs every year. Because if, if they're not, eventually then most of the gazelle are going to be slow and they're going to be weak. And that's, that's really hard. It's a really hard concept to, to integrate into your beekeeping practice, to, to expect losses. And I think that's largely because the modern model of beekeeping requires you to buy bees rather than either catch swarms or make splits or do things like that yourself where bees are free. And so I recommend people not buying bees at all because when you bring money into things, it tends to control the situation. And in beekeeping, I think that what happens is people end up being more focused on not losing their investment rather than embracing the natural process, the, the, the natural way that bees work. So the idea that if you treat your bees, they're gonna survive, and if you don't treat your bees, they're all gonna die. This is a screen capture from the Bee Informed National Survey, which if you're a beekeeper, I recommend you take that survey every year. 
um, and that will contribute to the overall mass of data that we get to use to come up with these numbers. So you can see here treated bees, how well can you read that? Treated bees, the loss rate, this is the average loss rate over since they began keeping track, I think started in 2011 or 2012, for backyard beekeepers. Uh, and this is varroa treatment versus not varroa treatment. As you can see, if you keep 10 hives, statistically speaking, the difference in loss is one. You're either gonna lose three if you treat, or you're gonna lose four if you don't. So it's not that big of a difference. And again, this is statistically, this is not predictive. You can't just, if I treat, I'm gonna lose this many. If I don't, it, it doesn't work that way. This is everybody all together, the average, how it works out of the, the grand scheme of things. But the idea is that, just to reinforce the idea that uh, re reinforce against the idea that treating equals bees living and not treating equals bees dying. And for myself, I can tell you I don't lose 43% of my hives every year. I lose generally between 5 and 20% as a sort of um, sustainable population. And I think that is uh, not only normal, it's desirable. Like that's, that's a really good spot to be in. So we don't have, we need to, what's a good way to say this? We need to understand that, that the context that we live in today is not the same that has been common throughout history. And, and this goes for anything, you know, with, be it with cars, certainly the internet. Most of you in here are old enough to remember before the internet. Um, you know, I didn't have the internet growing up. I was one of those uh, of the age that um, it was introduced in my teenage years and became part of my adult life. But my children are, have, are gonna have no concept of what the world is without the internet. The same thing with beekeeping. Um, before Varroa was introduced about 25 years ago, the, the main pest the main pests that, that people had to deal with diseases was American fowl brood and tracheal mites. Nobody even treats for tracheal mites anymore because basically what happened is Varroa showed up and people stopped having the energy to care. And the, the Varroa mites just kind of dealt with themselves because the natural selection happened because people were too busy dealing with something else. And the Varroa mites kind of went away, or uh, tracheal mites kind of went away. So, throughout history, in fact, before what? Before the 50s, 60s or so, there wasn't even a treatment for American fowl brood. And, and technically speaking, there is no treatment for American fowl brood. Um, the best you can do is mask it. So, don't, don't try to treat for it anyway. So, beekeepers throughout history kept bees completely treatment free up until just a few decades ago. So I think that's the best way that we can do it and what we should go back to. Um, in fact, beekeepers throughout history have kept bees without our modern Langstroth style hives. You know, there was, uh, as best we can tell, the ancient Egyptians kept bees in clay pots and logs. Uh, the skeps have been used. Everybody familiar with a skep? It's a hive woven out of grass, basically. Um, you got any of you guys familiar with uh, either Jacqueline Freeman or Susan Chernak McElroy? Mm -hmm. Just up here to the north? Yeah. There's some good examples of people keeping bees in non-traditional, non-traditional, traditional hives. Um, it's, it's, well, even... I struggle with, with putting names on things because even treatment-free, like my goal in life is, is that eventually treatment-free beekeeping will just become beekeeping. Like the, the conventional thing has only been around for three or four decades. You know, I'm, I'm 34, 
it's only been in my lifetime that this has become the way it is. It didn't used to be the way it is. And the other reason why I am not a treatment-free beekeeper is because it costs money and it's extra work. And not only that, but until recently, the treatments that were available were highly toxic and poisonous. Um, the one that was developed in the 80s called Kumafos is a neurotoxin used in agriculture. And you have to understand that you're, basically what they did is they took this pesticide which kills living things and they reduced the uh, they reduced the application rate a little bit and so you're sticking a poison in a beehive to kill things in the beehive just not the bees it's not good for anybody and in fact Kumafos still kills people to this day uh, in, in accidents and things used as a as an agricultural pesticide so no good so especially for new beekeepers I want to keep I want to keep the, the the cost out of it because it's expensive enough if you're buying hives or even if you're a, a good woodworker and you can make your own it's expensive enough to get started just with the equipment that you need. Um, even if you're starting with logs or something, you still have to get the logs. It's work, it's, it's time consuming, uh, and especially if you want to if you want to buy a conventional Langstroth hive, it's gonna cost money. The last thing you want to do is spend more money buying bees because as I mentioned before it's gonna introduce this mindset where you don't want to lose your investment. And the funny thing is with beekeeping especially, like beekeeping is, is the only hobby that I know of, the only pet that I know of where the pets are expected to pay for themselves <laughs> for some odd reason. Um, there's this idea that bees make honey and I can sell honey so the bees should make honey and I sell it and I make money to keep the bees. Um, most of us don't do it that way. Um, I, I like to get into that a little bit. You sell some queens and nukes and do talks like this. But it's not really for the money. It's, it's nice to make money to be as part of the process, to enjoy what you're doing. But when you're reliant on the money, or you expect the money, then it's going to color your experience and in most cases it's gonna end up souring the experience because bees die everything dies and if you're invested in it in a monetary sense that's gonna be very sad for you so I don't want to do that uh, the other problem with it is commercial beekeeping where most of the bees that are bought come from is really, in my view, the major detriment in the world of beekeeping altogether today. And the reason why that happens is because um, the major money maker in beekeeping today is almond pollination in California. And the problem with that is, if you think about it, bees are not meant to move, right? The hive is in a tree, naturally, generally or a hole in the ground or somewhere and it stays there all right when even when a hive swarms the swarm only goes at most a couple of miles away from the home location so when you have a population you know a certain number of colonies per square mile naturally um, and you introduce a disease into the population that disease is going to spread relatively slowly through the population. And the species, the, the population altogether, will have time to adapt because only a few of the, well, even if, even if a lot of the, the colonies end up dying from the disease, not all of them will. And those that don't will continue swarming and repopulating those ones that have been lost, those, those cavities in, in, in trees and things. 
But when you take millions of hives from around the country and you concentrate them in a relatively small piece of land, you now have spread those diseases that normally would have taken many years. You know, say it started in Florida, just because that's the corner. If it started in Florida, it would have taken many years for that disease to propagate across the country, giving the, po the whole population time to adapt. When you take all these colonies, you concentrate them in one spot. I guess California's over here for you guys. <laughs> when you concentrate them in one spot, then you spread the disease to all these colonies, and then you take them back out to the rest of the country, and now the whole country in one year has been exposed to this disease. And that can be catastrophic. And what we've seen, especially since, um, what, 2008, when uh, the colony collapse disorder stuff started happening, <coughs> it's, it's, it leads to mass die-offs. And the, the commercial beekeepers, there were many commercial beekeepers who lost all their hives. And then they invested a bunch of money to replace them all. And then they lost them all again. And you can only do that two or three times before you run out of money. So um, let's not support commercial beekeeping. One of the things that I recommend people do, how many of you do not have bees yet? Okay, so I'm sort of preaching to the choir now. <laughs> but if, if you're talking to your friends who are interested in getting into bees because they've seen that you have bees, uh, I recommend that people slow down um, there's there's a it takes there's a couple of things first of all a lot of people don't realize when they start that if I decide now in April that I want to be a beekeeper it's going to be awful hard to find bees this year everything that's going to be sold is already going to be spoken for by now usually uh, and even if you're going to start by catching swarms which I highly recommend Swarm season is already on, so getting some swarm traps together and getting things figured out, by the time you do that, chances are you're, you're going to miss most, if not all, the swarms. Um, but more than that, what if you decide you want to be a beekeeper and you get your first hive and you discover that you have a phobia of swarming insects? <laughs> This is a very real phobia. It's as real and normal as being afraid of spiders or snakes or heights or whatever. These, this is normal. Certain proportion of people have a phobia of swarming insects and you may not know that because you've never been <laughs> exposed to it, right? So I recommend people um, find somebody they know or know of or talk, find people who have bees and give them or not give them, coerce them into giving you an opportunity to get your hands in their hives and or watch or <coughs> get into it so that you know if this is something that you actually want to do because it's a shame that you should spend a bunch of money and time and research getting into something that's ultimately not compatible with you. Uh, you may even be highly allergic to bee stings in which case beekeeping may not be for you and that's okay but it's good to know that before you've invested a bunch of time and money in it <clears throat> so a lot of times when people get started As Americans, we are, we are steeped in a free market mindset. Not good, bad, or otherwise. I'm just saying that's the way we are. Um, but when you get into something new, you don't necessarily have the framework to make decisions on what you're going to do. Um, buying a car, for instance, most of you have bought a car. I imagine most of you have ridden in a car. You've seen cars. You could identify different types of cars if you were to see pictures of them. You know what buying a car is generally about. You even probably know reputations of certain cars are better than other cars. But what happens if you 
grew up in, in the mountains of Papua New Guinea and you have no idea anything about cars and you move to a big city and you need a car to get to work or something. You're completely lost. I don't know anything about cars. The same thing is with beekeeping. Unless you've grown up around bees or, or around someone who has bees, you don't really have the framework to make decisions on what you would want to do as a beekeeper. The, the type of equipment you want to use, um, the type of method you want to use, um, you, you just have no idea. And so a lot of people spend, and I, we spend a lot of time answering questions uh, on the Facebook group from people like this, um, who, when they ask a question, you can tell by the question that they have no idea what they're talking about because the question doesn't make sense from, from what you know as a beekeeper. The question doesn't make sense. They, you've got to clear something up first before you can even answer the question. And so what I recommend for new beekeepers is to find a mentor. Um, and this doesn't have to be necessarily somebody uh, you know. It could be someone online, someone who has a website or YouTube videos or uh, a couple of books or something. Something where you can get an idea of a universe of, of understanding, of methods that you can copy. And once you have them to copy and you get into it and you've got a framework to work with at the beginning, then you can change it. You can do your own thing, right? You, it's, you can break the rules once you know the rules. You gotta know, how, you gotta know the rules in order to properly break them, okay? So for instance, my model when I started was Dee Lesby. She is a beekeeper down in the Arizona desert. And at the time, she was just about the only successful treatment-free beekeeper there was. Uh, in 2003, even Michael Bush had only had his first year where he didn't lose all his bees, his first winter. So she was the only model at that point. Um, now, being from Oregon, and you all from Oregon also, following the methods of a beekeeper from the Sonoran Desert, or the whatever desert she's in, down there on the border of, of Arizona and Mexico, is probably not your best option. You can probably find somebody a lot closer to what you're trying to do than, than her. So, you know, Jacqueline Freeman, or um, Susan, or um, somebody further north would be good. Somebody, someone who has a winter would be good. Uh, <laughs> someone who has, and there are a lot of people around here, so there's, there's options. Back then there weren't. Uh, but one of the good things that she had was she had published a bunch of research papers and things on um, the B Source point of view site. And that, that has been recently published in a book. It's a nice thick 400 some page book that you can buy now. But it's still all the same stuff you can, you can read her research on the B Source website. So now that I've been doing it well, I pretty quickly graduated from her models and methods because I had something she didn't have, which is humidity. And you guys have even more of it up here than I do. <laughs> um, and rain, and uh, neighbors, and things like that, that that we all have that she didn't have. So I pretty quickly moved on. So there's some other options. Uh, ones that I like, uh, Jacqueline's on there. Um, Less Crowder, I think, is a good option if you want to go with non something other than a Langstroth hive. If you want to go to the top bar hive, something that's easier to build, much cheaper. Uh, he has uh, at least one book, but maybe more than one book, on top bar beekeeping, and you can find videos of him on 
YouTube and I've I've interviewed him on my podcast and so you can find him and you can you can copy his methods and adapt them and work with them. Now he is from New Mexico. He's currently living in Texas, so it's maybe not quite a good fit for here necessarily. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum would be Tr Tracy Smith. She's a beekeeper up in uh, up in central Canada, which is quite a bit colder here and drier. Um, Kirk Webster, I think, is a really good option if you're wanting to work with Langstroth hives. Um, he's got a website. He's not really an online person. I don't think you can... I don't even know if he has email. He might have email. But you can call him sometimes. He might answer the phone. Uh, but he, he's got... Uh, his website's really good. Really concise articles that he's written over the years learning how to keep bees treatment-free using nucleus hive methods and breeding queens. Sam Comfort's a good option. He's a little bit harder to get a hold of. Um, he's more into top bar hives, and he's, he's from New York, so there's that on the, uh, the climate front. You're looking for somebody who's a little colder. And then there's Michael Bush, who's got several books and a big website. And um, if you don't want to, if you don't want to buy books, it's a good option with Michael Bush because he's got a very expansive website, and his books are actually just his website. So you don't need to buy the book; you can get the information for free, which I recommend. Free is always good. So there's a few things that I, common things that I see, common mistakes that people make that I like to dissuade people from. Number one is not becoming involved with your local beekeeping people, your local beekeeping group. Like this is a great group right here. Um, the best information that you're gonna find for how to keep bees in your area is the people in this room. I'm not even the best for I mean, the, the, the difference in climate between here and Medford is pretty big. We are much, much drier than you, and probably a bit warmer also. So those differences are going to cause differences in your management techniques, and <coughs> it's going to cause difference in your swarming times and your, your blooming times. and a bunch of really substantial things that you might not think of you think a lot of people think that bees just act the same everywhere and if you if you take bees from here and you put them in uh, Wisconsin they're just gonna do what Wisconsin bees do and that's not the case at all it is very important when um, in treatment free beekeeping it is very important that you work with locally adapted bees bees that are accustomed to your nectar flows, your pollen availability, your swarming times, they're going to do so much better when they're adapted to your local area. And so if that's one of the reasons why I recommend working with swarms rather than buying bees is because most of those, well, some of them, depending on where the swarms come from, but you're going to get a better, <laughs> some of the swarms you're going to catch are going to come from trees that are here bees that are adapted to here not all of them you're going to get some from people who just bought a package of bees and it swarmed and but it's free so it's okay to lose it um, one of the things that I recommend people against is parroting information if if you're passing on information that you've read somewhere, even if it's really good information from a book or a website or something, if you're passing on information that, of things that you haven't done or haven't experienced, you're not helping. You're basically gossiping. It's not valid because you are undoubtedly missing important aspects that the original author included for a certain reason, but if you're reading something and imparting it to somebody else, you're missing key things and you don't know that you're missing key things because you don't understand their importance. All right, so um, talk about bees to other people, but when giving advice, 
talk about things that you've actually done. You know, I'm, I'm happy to tell you that I've never kept a top bar hive. I can't tell you the intricate ins and outs of keeping bees in top bar hives. I could parrot information from other people that I've read and the problem is I don't know how effective that will be. So I make a choice as an educator not to tell you about that. Or at least if I have to tell you some information, I will preface it by saying I haven't done this, but I've heard this is the case. So I think it's important that um, w in passing along information like that, we stick to what we know. And if you don't know, then just don't say it. Uh, and the other thing is, and this one's probably the most, um, the most important is, just beginning beekeeping the, the conventional way, you know, buy a book like um, Beekeeping for Dummies or uh, one of those other books that, that is got a lot of good beekeeping information, but it's, it's built around a more commercial mindset, right? It's, it's how do I explain this? Treatment-free beekeeping is a different style of beekeeping. It's a different focus. You do different things. Now, it's not worlds apart, right? It's just slightly out of phase from other styles of beekeeping. And so if you try to, to implement methods from other styles of beekeeping, like I was talking about earlier, the methods might not match with your goals. And so one of the things that I find people do a lot is they start with treated bees. They start with a package or a nucleus hive or packages are, are the worst. And they decide I'm going to be treatment free. And so they just don't treat. Everything else they do exactly the same, except for they just leave off the treating part. As if leaving off the treating part is functionally equal to leaving on the treating part. It is not. It changes so much. Because bees don't have, bees that, so back to the natural selection situation, bees that have been treated for 25 years, they have to be treated or they'll die. They become adapted to that management scheme. So if you're just going to do that, if you're just going to take that one major thing out of the equation, the equation is usually going to fall apart. Now, not always. When I started beekeeping, uh, I started with 20 packages. I was, my family motto is if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. So I started with 20 packages, which even, even today, you know, what's your package price here, package bees? Nobody knows? <laughs> What's that? Maybe about 100, 125. 125? When I bought mine, it was 30. So um, even with my, what was I making? 850 an hour job at the time, I could save up, my, uh, save up enough money over six or eight months so that I could buy 20 packages. It's much harder to do today, the price is much higher. And the bees actually now are much more dependent on treatments than they were back then. It's been 15 years since then. Um, so when you take out that, oh, and the, the other thing they do is they decide also that they're not gonna feed, which is, is a great idea if you, wanna, if you wanna keep bees without feeding, I, I recommend that. But to be successful at, in that regime from the beginning, you need to start with bees that come from that regime in the beginning. Uh, I prefer not to feed at all if I can get away with it. But there are times when I've got to compensate to, to further my goals, not the bees' goals, but my goals with, with numbers of hives and things that I want to do, that I have to do that. 
um, optimally when I reach my my optimal population what I want to do uh, I would not feed at all and bees that can't that don't bring in enough nectar just like in nature if they don't bring in enough nectar and store enough honey to survive through winter they won't survive through winter that's the way it's supposed to be so um, this is this, this goes back to why I recommend catching swarms if the swarms don't meet what they need to and they die you already know how to get more next year you can you can have you can afford to have patience to find those bees that you really want and the more swarm traps you have the more opportunities you have to do that I have 28 this year it's probably too many but that's you know everybody needs a hobby right <laughs> so how many hives should you have uh, is there what are the the laws for the city on how many hives you can keep on a property? I should probably should have looked this up. Four, you can have four without, and then above that, you need a permit. But that was just what somebody told me. Okay. Yesterday. Yeah. Diff <laughs> That's in Portland. In, That's in Portland. In Portland, there are no limitations, and you have to have a permit even if you only have one. Oh really? Okay. Different cities have different options. Uh, and a lot of times that's... The, the, the state um, requires you to pay, and it's not for a permit, but the state requires a paying of five or more hives. But okay. It's not, it's not permit related, it's just paying for really research, basically. Okay, cool. <clears throat> so a lot of people are going to be depending on what city you live in, limited by the number of hives you can keep. And you can get around that by keeping hives at your friend's house, which is nice. People in your neighborhood. Uh, and I recommend beekeepers kind of forming little co-ops and groups. So even if you only are able to have one hive, you still have that benefit of having more. Because any, any individual hive is going to have about a 60% chance of dying every year. The more hives you have, and I guess I could, if I remembered any statistics from college, that was one of the two classes that I got a C in. Um, but the more hives you have, or the more hives you have access to, the less chance that you're going to lose all of them every year. And that's, that's what I think is the most discouraging to people. If you keep four hives or something and you lose two, that's not that discouraging. You can split them and you can come back, no problem. Uh, but you have four or two or whatever and you lose all of them, now you kind of have to start over again, especially if you are not into catching swarms. And that's where it becomes really hard for people to justify continuing in the hobby. Uh, so I recommend, generally recommend five if you can, if you can get away with it. Um, but there's another thing, is if you're going to have, if, if your goal is five, you should be acting as though you want to have like eight or maybe even ten. And because what you really want to have is you don't want to have five, you want to have five when you come out of winter. When, when most hives die in winter that, that die, you want to have five when it comes out of winter because if you come out of winter and you had five going into winter because you wanted five, coming out of winter you might have lost one or two or three. Now you have two and it's going to be a little more difficult to come back to five from two. You can do it, but you're probably going to sacrifice honey production. Um, and it's going to be some work. But if you have eight going into winter and you lose three, now you have five. That's the five that you want. If you get very fortunate and say all of the eight survive winter and you really only want five, it then becomes pretty easy to combine those hives with the five that you have. And now you can do things like make bunker, bumper crops of honey because you've got You've, you've combined these hives and now they've got a huge amount of brood and a huge amount of um, forager bees and they're going to bring in a lot of honey. So you can actually produce a lot more honey that way. 
So more is better. I like memes. Memes are fun. So most people get starter kits, I think. Not everybody starts by building their own equipment. Some people do, and that's cool. People that have a uh, carpentry background or, or are good with working their hands, but not everybody. And so, the problem I see with this is they're gonna give you sort of a generic kit. Now it's gotten better in the last few years. The, the beekeeping suppliers have made greater number of options for beginning beekeeping kits. Um, so now you can get all medium kits, you can get all deep kits, you can get, um, you can choose various options. I like to, here's, here's, okay, so just this picture right here. Um, I don't use, in my beekeeping, I don't use a queen excluder normally. You may not want to use a queen excluder either. So if you're going to buy a beekeeping kit, you're going to pay for that. You don't need it. Uh, I don't want this book. This book is not a treatment-free beekeeping book. Um, there aren't a whole lot of treatment-free beekeeping beginning books. One of them is Complete Idiot's Guide to Beekeeping. Um, but most of the beginner beekeeping, especially books out there, teach you how to treat. And if that's not the book you want, then that's not the one you want. Uh, the Smoker. I recommend this is a medium size smoker, or the I guess the normal size smoker. Most people have the normal size smoker. I recommend getting the commercial size smoker. It's not a whole lot different from the normal size. It's just the the barrel is a little taller. The stove part is a little taller. And I find the bigger the smoker, the easier it is to light, the longer it will stay lit, and the better it will stay lit. So for an extra five or ten dollars, I find that is just a really good idea because it works a whole lot better. Some people don't smoke at all, so if you don't want to use smoke at all, then you don't want to buy that kit either. Um, what else do we have in the picture? So we have a hive tool which is pretty standard, but there are different types of hive tools. Maybe you want to try a different type of hive tool than the one that comes with the kit. Um, there's also smoker fuel, which you don't need. You can, there's, if you have a yard where you keep bees, there's probably going to be something in that yard that you can use for smoker fuel. So there's, I mean, you don't need to do that. And if you don't want to, that's, that's an option also. Uh, and then the bee brush. Bee brushes are nice, but bee brushes aren't required either. In fact, in the videos that I've seen from Germany, people actually use goose wings. So maybe you want to use a goose wing. I don't know. Oh, and then the suit. The suit is another one. Uh, how many of you have this style of suit? The one with the square veil? Nobody. Wow. Uh, I personally don't like the square veil with the helmet style. I have a very large head, and this is a 3XL hat, so most hats and helmets and things don't fit me. So I have, um, when I first started, I had just the veil that you wrap that string around yourself, and it really restricts your movement when you're trying to turn your head. So eventually I gave that up. I got a man like pollinator jacket, which is the kind that has like the, I guess the tombstone shaped face thing. I really liked those and I just had the jacket, but when I was in Arkansas at the time and it was so hot because it didn't breathe, it's just cotton. So I ended up, what, two years ago, upgrading to a man like vented suit. So it's the, it's three layers. It's like an outer mesh layer, an inner, um, kind of a thicker mesh layer, and then an inside thinner mesh layer. And for working out in the hot sun, it can't be beat. I've got the whole suit. So when I go out to work on the bees, uh, if it's really hot, 
I'll even take my shirt off underneath. So it's just like just wearing shorts. And so it's much nicer to, to work in the heat. Don't sweat so much, a whole lot more fun. And beekeeping is about fun. We, we as backyard beekeepers, hobbyist beekeepers, we're doing this for fun. We shouldn't be torturing ourselves to do this. If it's not fun, then don't do it. We're not doing it for money, we're doing it for fun. And then gloves. Uh, I don't like gloves at all. I try to work bees without gloves because with gloves you squish so many more bees and it's so much more clumsy and it's just, I can't, I just hate it. Uh, so I don't use gloves. So you can save, you know, in this, in this starter kit right here, like the only thing you might need is the smoker and the hive and the rest you don't need. Or you might want other options. <coughs> so you can save a bit of money. Oh, the other thing is, um, maybe you want to assemble it yourself and save some money on that. That's a good option as well. So where do you get your bees? I guess I've, I've already hounded packages enough already. Um, I'm very down on packages, not afraid to admit it. Packages are the worst option. There's, I think I have a graph, yeah. So this is average winter loss per beekeeper by the method of starting or obtaining colonies. Notice how packages have the highest loss rate, over 50%. Everything else is quite a bit lower. And why is that? I would say number one is because packages are a truly artificial way of starting a beehive. Um, it's, it's interesting when I talk to European bees, they talk about buying a swarm. And what, is, what do you mean buying a swarm? It turns out they're talking about package of bees or a shaken swarm. Um, but there's a fundamental difference between a package of bees and a swarm. If you've read, how many of you have read Honeybee Democracy? Good. In that book, Tom Seeley talks about what it takes to make a swarm work properly. And one of the things he discovered is if a swarm isn't full of honey, they won't do swarm things. They won't even go look for a new colony, for a new cavity. So a swarm, from what I understand, happens when forager bees come back from collecting nectar. They have a full stomach full of nectar and there's no bees in the hive to receive that nectar. And so they get sort of antsy and they start wandering around the hive and not working and eventually they'll go out and they'll start looking for new locations. And then when the when they eventually cause the swarm to happen um, as much as a third of the total weight of a swarm, you know, if you find a three pound swarm, one pound of that is honey in the stomachs of the bees. So when a swarm starts building comb in a colony, they are really good at it. They build a ton of comb very quickly. They have a mindset, they're, they're biologically programmed to start a new colony. But a package of bees, Basically how it works is they have this um, funnel with a queen excluder at the bottom and they take frames out of hives and they shake them into the funnel and the queen excluder keeps the queen from ending up in the package. Now sometimes she ends up in the package anyway and that often ends in a failed package because um, if there's a queen already in there then the queen that they put in with the cage will get killed by the workers and then the poor beekeeper thinks that their queen is dead and so they order a new queen and then it just gets ends up in a huge mess. But these bees were never, the, the swarming instinct was never triggered and so they're kind of lost and they don't have their original queen and they're not loaded up with honey and ready to start a hive and they're just they're just not prepared to do the job that they need to do. And that ends up putting them 
way behind other methods of starting. Uh, like if you're starting a, a, uh, a colony from a nucleus hive, a nucleus hive will end up th at least three weeks ahead. And uh, I've seen scientific studies that show this, that in growth and progress, a nucleus hive will be three weeks ahead of a, uh, a package hive from the beginning. And if you have a shorter season, I don't know your whole season up here, I think it's fairly long, but um, that can put them behind and, and can be the, the difference between a, a colony surviving the winter and not. So, so these are basically from worst to best. The other problem, the vast majority of package bees come from treated colonies. Um, they are often from warm climates, southern. On the west coast we get most of our bees from California, but a lot of the rest of the country gets their bees from the south, from Texas, uh, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, that whole area. And so those bees don't have any framework for how to deal with winter like, like we have here. Or in many of the people that I talk to, uh, you know, there's a huge proportion of the population in this country are across the northern half, well not the middle, but the northern half of, of either end of the country. And so all these packages of bees are being brought up from the south. They're not well acclimated and they end up having to be, just to survive, they end up having to be fed and treated and heavily managed and even then they don't do so good. You know, when I was in Wisconsin last year, there's so many, the, the, just the loss rates are just so great. So many people losing so many hives every year and it's just not helpful, it's not, not, not useful. So I recommend swarms, and if we have time I'll get into, uh, we'll do my um, swarm trapping talk, I think at the end, if you want. Um, great thing about swarms is that they're free, so if you don't get what you're looking for, it's like fishing, you can throw a fish back and get a new fish. Mm -hmm. um, you're not so worried about losing bees all the time. It's a lot more fun, I think, to catch swarms because it, it kind of reintroduces that wild element into beekeeping. Uh, swarms are um, just amazing things. I was recording a podcast this last spring, I think it was April 10th a year ago, and uh, was sitting in my living room recording with John Kiefus, who was in France, and suddenly my backyard was just filled with bees and I had a, had a little swarm trap sitting on my, my back porch and I was so much just wanted to run out there and watch it and I couldn't because I had another like 20 minutes of recording to do. But catching swarms is so much fun and um, for the same price that you can buy a package you know, 100, 120 bucks or whatever, you can build three swarm traps. And any reasonable swarm trap should catch at least, I mean, three traps should catch you at least one swarm a year if you've got, if you've got them built right and put in the right spots. Um, and even talking to, uh, you can, how many did you say you got six out of six last year? Yeah, that was, that was really good. <laughs> so on, uh, on my Facebook group, I kind of started a little contest this year. We've got, we've got some guys who get dozens and dozens of swarms. Um, but yeah, we're kind of trying to keep track of how many swarms people catch this year. And already there's, of course, people down in, in Southern California and Florida are already catching a lot of swarms. But swarm Swarm season should be starting like right now or, yeah, right now here. So some management goals. 
One of the mistakes I see a lot of new beekeepers make, and that is over inspecting. And I'm of two minds about this because inspecting too often is gonna set your bees back. When you're in there messing around with things, they have to reorganize, they <coughs> lose a day's worth of work. And that, especially in a new hive, is gonna be very stressful. And I think, um, I think quite a number of colonies every year get kind of inspected to death. So that's one of the benefits of having more colonies or trying to have or working with more colonies, catching more swarms, is you can spread that out a little bit. Colonies don't need to be inspected every seven to 10 days, which is what people normally recommend. I would recommend not doing any more than once every three weeks. Unless you're trying to do something like catch, uh, catch a swarm in, in action, you know, if, if, the, if the hive is, try, is making queen cells, then you can split it and you can make a bunch of new hives and prevent the swarm at the same time. So if you're, tr if you're looking out for that, that's fine, but that doesn't require a deep inspection. For most inspections, all you really need to do is uh, basically most of my normal inspections, I take out one frame from the end of the hive, set that to the side. It's usually just honey or empty or something. I spread it out in the middle, pull out one frame in the middle. If I see eggs or young brood, I know the queen is in there. I know everything's going fine. If there's nothing obviously wrong, I put those two frames back in and that's the end of the inspection. So, you know, 90% of the hive is, is virtually not touched. There's no reason to go, th there's no reason to find the queen. If you can find eggs, there's no reason to find the queen. Um, eggs hatch in three days. So if you find eggs, that means there was a queen there three days ago, which is good enough. And inspecting, trying to find the queen is actually a good way to accidentally kill the queen. So don't worry about it too much. Again, we don't want to inspect the hive to death. Another one is take the opportunity to, to increase whenever you get a chance. And we'll be talking about that here in a little bit with, uh, I'll talk about easy expansion and breeding methods. So like, like I said earlier, you want more hives. More hives gives you a greater chance of not losing all of them in a single winter. And the more hives you have, the more chances you have to find bees that can deal with mites and diseases well. I always recommend being a lifelong learner. Uh, that's something that was kind of drilled into my head in, um, in engineering school, but I already knew it from growing up. I grew up in a junkyard. We grew up learning how to use new tools all the time, learning how to build things. Um, I don't keep bees just to have bees. I keep bees to do new things with them every year. Like this year was the first year I shipped queens through the mail, so that was exciting. Went pretty well, might do it some more. What else was I gonna do this year? I had a couple of things on a list, but I misplaced it. Anyway, um, learn from your mistakes. If you keep doing the same thing over and over again, you're gonna keep getting a lot of the same results over and over again. So, um, try things different. If, if someone told you to do something and you did it and it didn't work, there's a chance that you did it wrong and you should try again. There's also a chance you did it right and it still failed, in which case you didn't try again. So, you know, maybe try it twice. I always try things twice just in case I messed it up the first time. The other thing is don't be afraid to make mistakes because one of, the, one of the things that I've been mulling over this year is that success ultimately has nothing to teach you. When you, let I me mean, think, about, think about people who are successful. They didn't just, when you hear people's stories about things that they're doing, stories are always filled with, this didn't work and this failed and then this happened and I tried and it didn't work and then something clicked and it worked. 
Right? That is the path to success. The path to success is paved with failure. When you do something right the first time, which everybody tries to do, you don't really learn anything. You've basically just copied somebody else. So don't be afraid to make mistakes. Do we have any questions? We'll take a quick break. Anybody have any questions? I have a question. Sure. You say you don't use um, when you excluders. Mm -hmm. uh, have you always, is that always when you're going to do things? And if so, do you have to find Yeah, the question is, uh, have I always not used queen excluders and do I ever find brood up in the honey? And the answer is yes, I have always not used, I have never used queen excluders normally. I do use queen excluders for queen breeding, which I'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, but when I, when I go to harvest honey, generally I harvest by the frame. I'm not Again, I'm not a, com a commercial beekeeper. I'm not trying to harvest. I just don't want to take the box off and blow the bees out and ship it to the extraction factory. Which extraction factories are pretty cool if you, you watch a YouTube video on that, but most of us don't do that. Most of us are, are removing just a couple frames at a time or if we're removing a box, um, it's pretty easy to take each frame out, dust it off, you know, uh, brush the bees off or shake them off and do it that way and so uh, usually by the time that I harvest honey in a year the brood nest will have been kind of pushed down by the honey by the, the honey cap in the hive and so occasionally there will be some uh, some drone brood and in that case I just uncap around the drone brood and do whatever and then put it back and the, the drones are fine or if there's, if there's still a lot of brood, then I just don't take that frame or that couple of frames or, or whatever it is.